Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming a very special guest. She is a Bay Area native like me, and a very talented renaissance woman of the world in the world of acting, Susan DeMonte. You may all know her, of course, from the Adventures of the Wilderness Family trilogy, but she also was in some 70s exploitation classics, such as the underrated horror, horror low-budget horror film, Blood Sabbath, uh, the New World classic, The Student Teachers, The Photographer. Um, she got to be in a uh, episode of Columbo that Ben Gazzara directed, and she was in uh, the movie Ladybugs with Rodney Dangerfield and her daughter, Vanessa Shaw. I'm having her on the show today to talk about all that stuff and also talk about um, <clears throat> some very inspirational stuff that I don't want to uh, spoil in this intro, as well as her uh, theater company. And it's going to be a really great show. I'd also like to say happy birthday to my good friend Terry Bolo, who's been on this show several times. I love Terry so much from the bottom of my heart. Happy birthday, Terry. Love you. So, uh, yeah, here is my interview with Susan DeMonte. Welcome to the show. How are you? Oh, I'm, uh, well, I'm great, um, but I threw my back out oh. lifting my grandson incorrectly after knowing better. Oh, that's terrible. You okay, though? I'm okay. I'm putting ice on it. <laughs> I slept in today, so... Well, oh, that's always yeah. good. It's, it's going to be what it's going to be. It's yeah. a pulled muscle, and it will have to heal. That's all there is to it, right? Right. Well, that's well. It's Just a, that I can't really rest that much, but mm-hmm. life goes on. Yeah. Well, it's it's such an honor. Thank you for taking the time today. Oh well, thank you for reaching out. My pleasure. So. Going back in time, did you fall in love with acting early on? You know, I think, you know, everybody says, oh, I wanted to be an actor since I was two or whatever, you know. Yeah. Um, for me, I think it was, um, I started taking dance lessons. Dance, I did tap, ballet, uh, modern, tumbling, uh, what else did we do? Um, baton twirling. I mean, it was just like a variety dancing. I started going every Friday after school. And, uh, I think that started kind of igniting my performance itch. Um, and we would do recitals and, you know, and parents would come and clap and take pictures and, so the attention was really extraordinary for a person that was kind of shy. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. Yeah. And uh, like you can see some of the pictures that I have of me in a flapper outfit with cap shoes on, and um, we played hobos at one point, and put, uh, painted freckles on our face, and. <laughs> Yeah, pretty cute. I bet you looked adorable. <laughs> I, I would admit that I did. Yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> and like me, you grew up in San Mateo County. Oh, you did also. Yes, I did. I, I grew up in, um, well, I was born in Palo Alto Hospital. Mm -hmm. And I grew up in... Well, what we used to call as teenagers Deadwood City, Redwood City, which is now very chic. Yes. <laughs> at the time, it was quite it was quite, it was quite Deadwood City when I was growing up. Um, and then we moved to Atherton. Uh, my 
father's business kind of boomed and built a house in Atherton. Um, and, uh, and that's when I moved out and moved into the city when I was 19 or 20. Yeah, I'm born, I'm, I was born at uh, Kaiser Hospital in Redwood City. Um, my, me, my mom, my dad, my brother, my aunts and uncles, yeah, we all are from San Mateo, all went to San Mateo High School and all that. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. My mom, she was in the same graduating class as um, Dennis Haysbert, the actor. Oh, really? Yeah. Which high school? At San Mateo High School, class of 72. Oh, okay. Class of what? 72. Uh-huh. Yeah, and they were very good friends. And I got to meet him when I was five. Very nice man. He seems like a nice man. Yeah. He's v- very big in person. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> Especially when you're five. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's a good that's that's a good way to, to uh, put uh, Redwood City, Deadwood City. It's especially like that now, you know. It's it's very hot over there, you know, and it's it's become you know little Mexico and stuff. And they've built all these projects there now and stuff. It's insane. <laughs> oh my gosh! Well, down downtown is pretty shishi though. With yeah. the restaurants and the uh, yeah, closed off streets and stuff. We never had that. We yeah. just had, you know, the Woodside Plaza that we used to go to. Oh, yeah. Um, after school and get a Coke and French fries. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hang out at the 76 gas station. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was a big hoot. Mm-hmm. So, so, did, so did you... So, you know, when I went... I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. You can go ahead. I was going to say, um, then I didn't, I mean, I, in junior high, we had, uh, like a talent show. I remember not being chosen and watching them through, you know, how you have sort of images, uh, when you were a child. And I remember standing on my tiptoes, looking in, you know, they had those doors with the little square window in the center. And mm-hmm. I was looking in there to watch them uh, rehearsing and wishing that I could be in there. And, uh, and then it wasn't until high school, I never considered myself an artist or anything. That was just like a, a hobby, things I liked, you know. Yeah. Um, going to the movies with my mother. My father would go to the motorcycle races, and then my mother would take me to um, the movies. So I got to see, you know, great acting and amazing movies, and it, I loved going into that kind of state of mind of just being absorbed in a story. And then in high school, uh, I think it was either my junior or senior year, um, I tried out for Pon Pon Girl and it was selected. Oh yeah, for my senior year, I was selected as Pon Pon Girl, and also I joined um, a drama class. Mm-hmm. And and um, I, I think his name was Mr. Hall, I believe. But you know, you have those. Everybody has to have a mentor that encourages them, right? So mm-hmm. he and he really encouraged me and saw something in me and uh, kind of sparked a little flame inside about that. Oh, that's great. Yeah. And then, do you want me to go on? Oh, uh, I, wanted to, I, I wanted to ask, uh, so, so uh, before high school, I mean, did you do any um, community theater? I didn't do any community theater. I only, you know, like I said, my senior year is when I really took an acting class and started to learn what acting. It wasn't just fooling around dancing and singing and, you know, to my family and whatnot or to, you know, for a recital. There was actually um, reading, you know, reading books and getting trained, you know, 
voice and studying playwrights. And that was a, in high school, in my last year of high school, was when it became sort of a serious possibility. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so then uh, you went to Kenyatta College? Yes, I went to Kenyatta College when it first opened, I think, or the year after it opened. Mm-hmm. And uh, and that's when I started doing, I got, I did a Beckett, a play Beckett. I did the, um, I think we did Three Penny Opera. I started, you know, doing, doing theater at my community college. I took, I actually got an associate of arts degree in drama. Mm-hmm from Kenyatta College. And it was then that I started, um, when I, I went to San Francisco to, well actually, it was my mother, you know, so here's the next sort of mentor. My mother, when I graduated, she was like, what are you gonna do? And I said, I don't know, I I thought I was gonna be the secretary to uh, a celebrity and travel around with them and do that, because I very organized person, good good handwriting, good uh, organization skills and typing, all of that. I never thought of myself as being out in front for something, for some reason. Mm-hmm. And so my mother, uh, this is kind of a funny story. I actually put this story in my solo show, which I guess we could talk about later. But mm-hmm. um, So we're sitting there and my mom saying, what are you going to do? And I said, I don't know. I'm I'll be a secretary to someone famous and travel around. You know, I wanted to travel. And she said, well, I read, I read this article where this woman took her kids up to San Francisco and got them an agent and they did commercials and they made a lot of money. And you're pretty and you're talented. And you should go do that. And I said, well, how am I going to go do that? And she said, well, let's, let's call Channel 2 and ask them how that how, how you could be a commercial actress. And so <laughs> we, called, we called Channel 2, I think it's, it's in Oakland, KTVU or something, and yeah. a guy answered, he goes, oh, no, 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 you have, to, you have to get an agent. We don't, you know, just hire people off the streets to do commercial. <laughs> we, we knew nothing, right? Right. So... Um, he said there are two, I think there were two agencies, the Ann Brebner Agency, she just passed away at like 92 yeah. or something. Um, Ann Brebner and Demeter, I think, was the other one. And so I just called them up and made an appointment, and my mom took pictures of me with a Polaroid camera, and <laughs> off I went. She goes, you should go in person, just, you know, when I get job, summer jobs, I go up there in person, and look them in the eye and they give me the job because I had the initiative to get there. So I kind of walk in and sit there with my Polaroids and I don't think actually I did even have an appointment. I think I just showed up and went to the, you know, the desk and I said, I'd like to be in commercials, please. <laughs> and the woman <laughs> said, um, well, you have to be in SAG. I said, what's SAG? It's that the union, that's the Screen Actors Guild, where you have to, you know, you have to be a member of that to do commercials. And so, well, how do I be in SAG? And it just then, um, the modeling agent came out and saw me, looked at my pictures, and mm-hmm. she said, um, "Do you have any experience?" And I said, "No, I'm just here because I have to, you know, I want to, I want to be in commercials." And so she said. I want you to go to John Robert Powers Modeling and Finishing School in Palo Alto and learn the tricks of the trade and get some pictures and then come back and see me. And so I went to my father and he paid for me to go to John Robert Powers Modeling and Finishing School Mm -hmm. and I became like their star and I was going around promoting for them and taking photos and learning how to put makeup on and to, we did tea room modeling and live modeling and ramp modeling and photography. And so that's when it really started. I got 
some attention going on. And then I went back to them and brought them my pictures and they signed me. And uh, I started working as a model. First of all, uh, I worked with um, Joanna Cassidy and oh, love uh, Joanna. Suzanne Summers. Uh, they were ahead of me. They were kind of like the seniors. Of, yeah, I love Joanna. Yeah. She's still, we still communicate on uh, social media. We were going to meet together, but we have, haven't had that happen yet. <laughs> yeah. So I started doing modeling, and then I modeled for, I don't know if it's still there, the Belmont Horse Raceway? Probably not. No, no, it's long gone. <laughs> long gone. So they had the horse races there, right? And mm -hmm. I was hired to dress up like a pilgrim lady during Thanksgiving and give out turkeys. And I was holding a live turkey by a leash. And they take pictures of me with the winter circle, um, you know, disc jockey, uh, not disc jockeys, um, jockey. And uh, mm -hmm. while I was there, and you know, I had the whole pilgrim outfit on. I have a picture of that. Hilarious. <laughs> and this woman came up to me and said, have you ever thought of running for the Miss America pageant? And I said, oh, no. I, even still, at this point, Tommy, I, I just didn't really think I had it in me to, you know, I'll model a little bit, but I'm not really, like, a talented person. And so she goes, well, what do you do besides acting? I mean, besides modeling. And I said, well, I sing a little bit, and I, you know, took some acting classes and but she said, well, come to our tea. We have an introductory tea. Or maybe you could do a monologue or, you know. So I went, so then I got the competition spirit and went to the, uh, to the tea where all the girls were there. And I thought, oh, I can, I can beat these girls. <laughs> so then <laughs> the big turn in my life was I saw Funny Girl with Barbara Streisand. Right. And I saw, I must have seen it. If you were a friend of mine at that time, I would have dragged you there. I think I saw it eight or nine, maybe ten times. Took everyone I know, all my family, <laughs> friends, to see it over and over and over again. And everybody said, well, you know, what? did you connect to that movie? Because it's about an ugly girl that nobody notices. And, and I said, you know, I call it the... Um, the curse of the attractive person, where everybody thinks you have it made, but you feel invisible because people just look at you for your outside. They don't try to get to know you. They just kind of yeah. accept you or accept you for you know what you are physically. And so when Barbara said that line, I'm a bagel on a plate full of onion rolls. Nobody recognizes me. <laughs> I really related to that. And so I wrote a monologue. It's the first time I wrote. Um, and I wrote a monologue on my own because we couldn't get the rights to any of the script, the funny girl, and sang I'm the Greatest Star. And I won the crown of with San Mateo County. Wow. It went on. <laughs> <laughs> and then went on to California and Susan Anton was oh. outgoing Miss California, and everybody, all the press, all the newspapers, everything were saying, oh, Susan DeMonte is going to be the next Miss California. And later on, I found out from Eddie Foy, who was a casting director and one of the judges when I came to Hollywood, that mm -hmm. there was an old-time judge. Her name was Irene something. And my being a brunette and the tap Italian and not exactly, you know, a skin and bones, have curve, I'm a curvy person. She felt that Miss California needed to be blonde and skinny. And so she put me at the bottom of the list at the last minute mm -hmm. and, put, and put the other girl at the top, who was Miss Hayward. She was a blonde, skinny violinist. And I lost by like one point, something like that. Oh. <laughs> and so it was devastating at the time 
But then um, the arts and entertainment editor of San Mateo County newspaper, San Mateo Times, I guess it was, he yeah. uh, became a big fan of mine and wrote a big article slamming the pageant for doing that to me. And he didn't know that that would actually happen, but he said it was outrage. And so he sent me to Atlantic City the next year as a reporter for the San Mateo pageant. And then after that, I was invited back to dance at the next one for California and Santa Cruz. And everybody was trying to make up for it. But then I used my huge scholarship of $600 to uh, pay for part of my going to the American Conservatory Theater in San Francisco. And that's where I really solidified myself as an actor and artist. Mm -hmm. Classic training there. Wow. And is that what led to um, being cast in The Candidate? Yeah. That was, um, actually, I was doing extra work um, while I was modeling and, and studying acting. And um, I was, I showed up at the Paramount Theater in Oakland. At, well, first of all, I auditioned for this um, role that I eventually got. But here's the irony of that. Mm -hmm. I always tell actors, when I'm talking to actors, I say, you know, you, you really, you, could, you go and you do your best. You really cannot control what the outcome is. You just have to go in with your training, your confidence, and do your best shot because so many factors come in, right? So I go in. I was um, wearing kind of like, you know, I don't know if you, they don't have them. They might, be, they might still have them, but uh, glasses that go, Outside they get dark, and then inside they they go light. And so I had these huh. glasses that kind of looked like back in the glorious Steinem days, you know, these wire rim glasses, and my Jack hair was down to my butt. <laughs> and so I put my contact lens. I took off my glasses, put my contact lenses in, curled my hair, put a nice dress on, and went to audition for Hoyt Bauer for the role that I eventually got, and they never called me. Oh. And so I just went um, on an extra, I was being atmosphere, went to the Paramount Theater, was sitting with jeans on and my glasses and my hair straight down to my butt and just had my feet over the front of the chair. Mm -hmm. And Michael Ritchie, the director, walks up to me and says, hey, um, are you an actor? And I said, yeah, I'm here to do extra work. I said, well, I said, I'm, he goes, are you studying acting? Do you know how to act? I said, I'm studying at the American Conservatory Theater. Mm -hmm. And he said, can you, can you come with me? I want you uh, to meet Robert Redford. I think we have a part for you. <laughs> and so I, I met Robert Redford and I met um, Peter Boyle, mm -hmm. who was playing his you know, campaign, campaign manager. And they hired me that day to play a groupie, the political groupie that they ended up playing in that role. And they asked me, do I want to be Screen Actors Guild or Screen Extras Guild, that was called. At that time, they were both separate. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I were to do Screen Extras Guild, that I could work with them for six weeks, travel with them around the Bay Area, become a lighting stand-in for the woman that was playing, Karen Carlson, who played his wife. Mm -hmm. and, but I would not get a credit. Um, I would just, you know, be in the movie at the end. I took the, the extra work because I got the best film production training from that day forward. And Redford sat me down and explained the importance of my role. And then I got, you know, close to everybody on the crew and the set and learned two shot over the shoulder, you know, close up, all the terminology in that six to eight weeks that I worked on that, on uh, the candidate. Unfortunately, wow. I didn't get a credit, but if I describe my part to people, 
they go, oh my God, that was you. <laughs> this is kind of an outstanding role. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I, I, I think it's a great movie. And um, Michael Ritchie, I, I think he's one the, he was one of the most underrated American directors. What, was he great to work with? He was. He, you know, he was... Uh... Sorry, I'm taking a sip of tea. Mm-hmm. Um, the thing that I learned from him is that you have to do your work as an actor and come in. Like a lot of directors might direct you in your performance, but he did not. He was more like, here's the scenario, here's what the visual is. We're going to see you walking down the hallway. Redford's character is going to come before you. Peter's character is looking for him. Where is he? He's missing. There's going to be, you know, they're waiting for him to appear. And mm -hmm. so I want you on the left of the hallway, and I want him on the right of the hallway so we see you both. But you come out of the room count to three to come out of the room afterwards. And don't forget, you just had an affair together. <laughs> That's all he would say. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so then, you know, it's good because then you have to think, okay, what, let's think of things. Well, what would I be doing? I'd be maybe continuing to sort of straighten my skirt and get my mouth or um, have, you know, have that in my consciousness that where I just came from and where I was going. Mm -hmm. Wow. But he was good at that, yeah. And then uh, you you did the uh, underrated horror classic Blood Sabbath. <laughs> yeah. You think it's <laughs> underrated? <laughs> I, it, it's got a good premise. I mean, it could have moved a little bit faster, but it's got a good premise. Yeah, I think it did too. I mean, of course, what it originally was supposed to be was not what it ended up being. Did you know this? I, I, I kind of figured that as I watched it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was really kind of uh, going to be like a fantasy film mm -hmm. um, where, you know, um, she's like, my character is a, a nymph that lives under the sea. And Tony Geary's character is, you know, like a Vietnam vet, and he's forlorn and has PTSD, although they didn't call it that then. Mm -hmm. um, and he's just forlorn and doesn't know what he's doing with his life, and she appears and gives him hope and love. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what it was. And it was called, actually, originally it was called Yala, Y-Y-L-A, Yala. Y Y A L A. Yeah. That was and, your character's uh, name. Pardon? Your character's name. Yeah, that's what it was called. Yeah. Um, it became Blood Sabbath when they kind of did reshoots with um, all the witches in the Haven and the sacrifice. Well, they did have the sacrifice in the original script, but they just beefed it up with a lot of nude witches running around. <laughs> <laughs> this production. <laughs> is, is Tony Geary as crazy as he presents himself on screen? You know what? He, um, at that time, he was just, he was a little ahead of me too, maybe a year or two here in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And he was a very gentle guy. I mean, he, he brought the guitar into his character. They didn't have that written. And, um, yeah, we stayed, we stayed connected for a long time, and probably if I, I don't know how to get a hold of him now, but even if I did, I, I actually ran into Jeannie Francis and told him, told her I was, you know, one of my, one of my first films with him, and, yeah. and she said I'm sure he would, he would remember. <laughs> yeah. What about, uh, yeah. what about Diane Thorne? Now, which one was Diane Thorne? Was she the queen? She was the queen, yes. Yes. I didn't really get to know her very well. Um, because I don't think her scenes were when I was around that much. Okay. I remember. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, it's it's funny because at that time horror was in a really weird state because uh, George Romero had changed horror with with um, with Night of the Living Dead, but then filmmakers couldn't like you know keep up with that kind of genius. So then they started doing all these like kind of hippie hippies in in a rustic area type stories, you know, because it was at the time of the Manson family killings and stuff. And so oh, right. that, that was the only inspiration they could draw from. Like there was a movie a couple of years before this um, about hippies um, in a cult. It was called I Drink Your Blood. And <laughs> it wasn't until it wasn't until Texas Chainsaw Massacre that changed the horror forever. A couple oh, of years yeah. later. Yeah. It was a, it was a, it was, it was an interesting time at, at that time. You then, um, yeah, did you, oh, go ahead. You, uh, you, I mean, you know that, uh, my daughter is Vanessa Shaw, right? Yes. Yeah. Well, she, one of her first films she did was a friend of mine, Nettie Pena, um, was a horror film. And, um, what was it called? I think they renamed it Thanksgiving or something, but it was about, you know, these teenagers going to a house and they bringing their little cousin with them. She was four years old at the time. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever seen that, but I thought that was not a bad, bad movie. Oh, I'm looking it up right now. It's, it's home sweet home. Home sweet home. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah with Jake Steinfeld. <laughs> it was Jake Steinfeld. Yeah. Oh my God. Whatever happened to that guy? <laughs> I don't know. Well, he, you know, he made a lot of money on exercise videos, I, you know, yeah. day, but I, I don't know what happened after that. Wow. Her first movie was with him. That's crazy. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> and everybody was kind of like, how, you know, how could you have your four-year-old daughter with, you know, blood and knives and all that? I said, you know, it, it's acting. From the start, you know, she... She didn't really begin acting or actually ask me to stop acting and teach her until she was 11, but she was always, you know, on the track. Yeah. Been in the blood, yeah. And then you followed it up with a New World classic, The Student Teachers. Yes. I'm looking at the poster in my house right now. <laughs> it's classic. That poster... The girl at the bottom was not even in the movie. It was, you know, Roger Corman wanting to have symmet symmetric, uh, symmetrical picture mm -hmm. all of us. But, yeah. That was also something that started out a certain way and ended up a different way. Um, Jonathan Kaplan, one of his first films, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was, a, I, I always told him, I was his precursor to um, Jodie Foster's rape scene in The Accused. Yeah. That's and a good movie. It was called The Learning Factor to begin with. And it was a really smart script, actually. Um, you know, very making social statements about sex education and... Um, you know, deviant behavior, et cetera. And I was a student teacher and yeah, I really learned a lot working with Jonathan Kaplan. He, he helped me to pull out a lot of my skill. So he was a great director. Yeah. He was a Roger Corman, uh, protege. And yes, he was. And speaking of Roger Corman, you got the, the great Dick Miller playing the coach in the movie. Oh, yeah. Is he still alive? Uh, he died back in January, and I just interviewed his wife like two weeks ago. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. He was amazing. I stayed in touch with him. You know, he was so concerned about a race scene that he came to my apartment. He said, I want to come over, and I want to, you know, I don't think we're going to have time to choreograph it. I want to know you know, exactly what I'm doing. I don't want to hurt you. I don't want to, you know, make you feel uncomfortable. And he's a great gentleman, great actor. Yeah, I, I met him at a horror convention two years ago, and 
he 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 looked like he was you know nearing the end, but he was a, a real gentleman. I have to say. Uh, how did he die? I think it was just natural causes. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'll never forget his kindness. He was just really concerned that. And you know, as an actor, I was like, well, you do, you know you you have to get a rise out of me. You can't you know it's a going to be a, a brutal and crucial scene, so we can't just fake it. So, you know, we figured out a way to make it so that it was realistic. Yeah, everybody that ever worked with him just loved wor working with him, and he spent most of his career at home in front of the phone waiting for it to call, and it did call all the time because they just loved working with him. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. It's important to be a person that people want to work with. Yes, it is. Yeah. You then had um, a role in The Photographer. Yes. Have you seen it? I think I saw some yeah. of it uh, years ago. Yeah. Yeah, that was, uh, that was also a great acting um learning experience for me with Michael Cavanaugh, um, who was, I think, quite popular at that time as You mean actor. Michael Callan? What's his name again? I'm sorry. Michael Callan. Michael Cavanaugh is a character oh. actor. Oh, right, right, right. Okay, get it. got that wrong. Yeah, Callan. Michael Callan. Yeah. Um, yeah, he played the photographer. And... Um, The scene that was the most challenging was that um, he, you know, he's, he kills all of his victims. I mean, his modeling choices. Mm -hmm. And mine was he put rat poison in my smoothie. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how the writer thought of that. I, I didn't even know um, I didn't even know smoothies were popular back then. <laughs> yeah, it was like a protein drink and smoothie. Yeah, um, and he put rat poison in it, so I had to do this whole thing of going blind, and it was quite method acting <laughs> <laughs> to try to think of what would it be like as you're slowly poisoned to death. <laughs> I, I can imagine it'd be pretty scary. <laughs> scary, right? So, you know, I think I really started honing my skill as an actress during these earlier movies. And Bill Hillman, I'm still connected to on Facebook, and you know, we reconnected when Facebook came about. Mm -hmm. And you, you got to do um, an episode of Columbo with Ben Gazzara directing. Uh, just amazing. Fantastic. Yeah, that was fun. We went on a cruise on the uh, Mexican Riviera. Everybody was getting sick. I don't get seasick, thank goodness, but <laughs> everybody was like, well, we lost another one. They're down there, you know, up checking. Yeah. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. And, and actually, you know, I have a lot of people still write to me about that. They're very hard, fast uh, Colombo fans out there, and people send me screenshots of me, of course, being a nurse and also smoking cigarettes at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Not that nurses don't do that anymore, but on camera, it's been a little weird. Yeah, I, I saw like every episode when I was a kid when it was reran, and this one has. Lots of great guest stars in it. Robert Vaughn, Jane Greer, Bernard Fox, Robert Douglas, Patrick McNee. Wow, you were in good hands there. <laughs> I totally was. And we had so much fun at dinners. And yeah, it was great. And then Peter Fall, here's the other trivia, is did a movie with my, my daughter later on um, uh, with um, Chris Kattan. Oh, uh, uh, Corky Romano. <laughs> Corky Romano. <laughs> and Vanessa invited me on the set, 
and I reminded him about me. He was like, what do you do? Are you taking some mute serum? You haven't changed a bit. <laughs> oh, yeah. God. That's so great. A scarily irascible person he was, always. Mm-hmm. Then you made a name for yourself in the classic uh, Wilderness Family series. Yes. How did you get Still. so How did you get so lucky to be a part of that? You know, it was a lucky thing. I um, I had started practicing Nichiren and Buddhism by this time in 1972, the chanting of Nam Myoho Renge Kyo, and became a volunteer leader. I jumped into it. It's a world peace movement. I just felt. I just gained a huge um, sense of purpose in my life from beginning that Buddhist practice and joining the, the Gakkai FGI. And we were, um, we were having a culture festival in Hawaii, and mm -hmm. we had been planning for it for like a solid year. And I had um, auditioned for the Wilderness family, and then they called me back, I remember I hearing that um, Rick Nelson's wife was, uh, it was between her, she and I, I believe. Mm -hmm. And um, I just had the wisdom to not have glamour at all. Put a scarf on my head, no makeup, no lipstick, you know, check shirt, jeans. Mm -hmm. um, and just go in like that. And I remember they told me afterwards that I started the I started the uh, callback scene with um, Robert Logan, and I didn't feel it was going in the right direction, and so I stopped. And I said, "Do you mind if we start again?" And we started again, and then I nailed it. And that's what they said, you know, secured me the job. They, they felt secure that I would be um, be able to handle, you know, handle that lead role. And so, of course, they were beginning rehearsals in the Wasatch Forest of Utah the same weekend I was supposed to fly to Hawaii for this culture festival. Mm -hmm. And it was a crucial moment for me. I was just torn and so I prayed on it, chanted, and I decided that I was going to go to the culture festival because it was for my life, you know, for the rest of my life. I, I you know, I planned on being an actor the rest of my life, and another film will come along. It was the first lead role that I'd ever gotten. I loved, the, you know, loved the uh, premise. I auditioned with the kids. The kids and I fell in love, Holly and, and Ham and I just fell in love. And, but I decided they wouldn't let me come late. Art Dubes, the producer, was very strict and frankly kind of a bully. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he just said, no, uh, you're out, which everybody was devastated. But I went and had the most amazing experience in Hawaii and came back and on my answering machine, yes, we didn't have cell phones back then, <laughs> <laughs> answering machine were about 10 messages, I think the tape was full, of them calling me from Utah, asking me to come. That the woman they hired was terrible, she wouldn't, didn't want to walk in the water, she wanted rubber sandals, she had her nails painted, she, Kids hated her. Could I come? When could I come to to Utah? So that's how I that's how that happened. It was I think the next day I flew out there and shot the first one, and then seventy eight the second one, mm -hmm. and then near eighty I think it was seventy nine or eighty was the third one. Yeah. It was Crested Butte, Colorado. Robert Logan, he pretty much retired. Are you still in contact with him? 
No, you know, he started raising, I think, alpaca. Is it alpaca horses? Not alpaca. Um, he, he started raising, like, rare horses in Aspen, Colorado. Mm-hmm. He just, um, I guess he just got discouraged from the money-making machine of Hollywood. I mean, you have to have a perspective on it. Yeah. You have to realize that it is a machine and that sometimes people step all over everybody, but he was just too sensitive, I think. I mean, I'm, I'm guessing, speaking for him, but um, from what I heard, we kept in touch for a little bit, but um, yeah, he just had a sour experience and left the business. Oh, that's sad. I know. I think he did one series after The Women the Family, and then that was that. But he was smart. He he negotiated a good deal. I did not. He got a point, I think, um, on the movie. So mm-hmm. oh, that's good. I get like I get like fifteen cents every time I play something like that. <laughs> What, what was George Buck Flower like to work with? Oh, I actually interviewed with another um, podcast guy um, a few months ago about him. He was doing a story on him. Mm-hmm. He was hilarious, skillful, funny, but actually he didn't really mix socially with us that much. He would just go back to his room and afterwards, we, you know, we'd We'd go out to the Wagon Wheel restaurant or whatever was there at, in, in that little town of, what's it called, um, Utah. Uh, I can't remember the name of it right now, but little tiny town. They had a couple of restaurants there. One was called the Wagon Wheel. We'd go and him. But, um, yeah, he was, the kids loved him because they go, take your teeth out, take your teeth out, and He'd take his teeth out and talk, you know, mm-hmm. with his lips and make <laughs> them laugh like hell. Yeah. Yeah, everybody knows him as the homeless guy in the Back to the Future movies. That's right. <laughs> yeah, crazy drunk driver. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, unforgettable guy. Yeah, everything he was in, you know, you, you just you knew, you knew that face, you know. <laughs> That's a face you can never forget. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I used to see those those wilderness family movies on the Disney Channel. They used to be on like right after the Swiss Family Robinson movies. That's right. Yeah, yeah and now they're on Amazon, and I think Lionsgate um, bought bought them. Yeah, it's sad that TV doesn't play them anymore, though. I know, but yeah. I get. So many letters, Tommy, in my on my Facebook page mm-hmm. of people who I grew up with that movie. Now I'm showing it to my kids, and they're showing it to my grandkids, and we love that movie. Can't you know? There's not movies like that that are you know family oriented, but also adventures, and you don't fall asleep, and they're non animated, and parents can watch it and also be entertained, and you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then, you know, thank you so much. That was the one movie that I grew up loving that my parents could would let me watch and watch it over and over. It was so heartfelt. It's amazing. You know? Yeah. It's. Movies are inspiration to many people. Yes, they certainly are to me. I mean, without movies, I can't breathe. Yeah. Yeah. Here's a favorite of mine that I just have always loved. Uh, you and Vanessa got to be in the Rodney Dangerfield classic Ladybugs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know I got some balls. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got a lot of balls. <laughs> I got a lot of balls over here. You know, he was interesting. I don't know. I guess I could tell this is a this is not a P P D rated show, is it? No, it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> so we go to the hotel to rehearse with Rodney, 
right? Yeah. And I'm there because my daughter's, in, you know, she's a minor, mm -hmm. and uh, and Jonathan Brandis's mom is there because he's a minor, and we knock on the door, and he comes to the door with a robe on, and that's it, and yeah. it's not barely closed. <laughs> And as he walks around, hey, you want something to eat? We got some uh, stuff on the table over here, you know. And yeah. his, his uh, robe is flapping open. <laughs> he sits down. And I'm like, Vanessa, sweetie, let's you know, go over here to this side of the room <laughs> so you're not looking directly at his junk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've interviewed. Also, <laughs> Go ahead. You know, but also, you know, just a really fun and kind-hearted person. Yeah. Yeah, I've interviewed a lot of stand-up comedians who have hilarious Rodney stories. One of my absolute favorites is when this one time uh, he went to Sam Kinison's hotel room. Sam Kinison was passed out drunk. He hadn't shaved for a few days. His belly was hanging out, and he had... Uh, bottles all around him and stuff and, and Rodney walked in and he said hey get a load of Nero <laughs> he said what I'm sorry he said get a load of Nero <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like it I love that story <laughs> oh my god that's hilarious yeah oh. my, my dad he took me to see this movie when I was eight and a half, and we were the only two people in the theater. Really? Yeah. And in, in hindsight, that, that that's signals to me that, you know, Rodney's box office appeal was slipping at that time. Yeah, that's true. It kind of was. After Caddyshack. And Back to School and Easy Money and all those. Oh, well, yeah, those were good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, the, the funny part is, is that it, 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 uh, Rodney, you know, he got to pull off a family film like this after doing those raunchy comedies, and he, he didn't become a star till he was almost 50, and here he was at 70, and he finally hit an age of maturity in his career. <laughs> Isn't that something? I yeah. know. Yeah. You just never know. I mean, I'm counting on that for me in the next 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why not, you know? Yeah. You never give up. Never give up, no. Yeah. I remember you guys did a um, an HBO behind-the-scenes documentary of the movie, and there was a part where <laughs> Rodney is uh, is uh, being inappropriate with Vanessa. He's, like, you know, kissing her and stuff, and then you show up, and you're like, hey, I thought I told you to leave my daughter alone. <laughs> oh, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> I think that was his idea. <laughs> yeah. It's brilliant. <laughs> yeah, totally. I still have that on tape too. That I, the tape, oh, really? That tape is almost twenty-seven years old. I still have it. Unbelievable! Wow. Yeah. I think I have it somewhere, but who knows? Yeah. In the archives of the VHSs. Yeah, yeah. It's it's funny because that's the kind of humor I try to project. Um, in my stand-up comedy and on my podcast, you know, because I think in this age of Me Too, you know, we should show men how not to treat women through humor, you know? That's right, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and he was so, he was so, um, how should I say, protective, mm -hmm. and conscious of the girls and their mothers, and, and actually he actually fired... Um, one girl and her mother because of um, some kind of a thing of racial or ethnicity uh, conversation that went on, and he said, I don't tolerate that. I like that. Oh, and, my God. Yeah. It was kind of devastating because the girls loved that girl, but um, he said, no, you're out, and they had to go home. Oh. That's heavy. Wow. Yeah. Wow. He said, I don't want to have that. I want this to be a joyful place where, you know, we're having fun making a movie. Mm hmm Wow. That's and we fell in love with Jack A, too. She was great. Oh, yeah. She must, have, she must have been a hoot on that set. She was a hoot. Totally. 
<laughs> she had some great lines in that movie too. <laughs> she did. <laughs> in fact, I don't know. Vanessa uh, posted on her Instagram when uh, the female uh, soccer team won the world champion, mm-hmm. and she, she put a picture of them all jumping, jumping around from ladybugs jumping around and high fiving around uh, Rodney on her Instagram, and she's like, we won! And everybody, she had comments, hundreds of comments from people going, and a, a, my, one of mine was, yes, get those nail breakers. Oh, yeah. You remember that line? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I, I remember I saw a deleted scene once, I think it was in the trailer for the movie, where that that girl who, who's, whose nail got broken, you know, she was like a really flirtatious type of little girl, you know. She says to Rodney yeah. that she thinks he's handsome, and Rodney says, Oh, why is it every time I have a chance to get laid, the situation's always impossible? <laughs> oh, God. I totally didn't know that one. Yeah. Oh, uh, raunchy, raunchy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but he was never inappropriate with any of the girls or anything like that. Yeah. That's, that's that's good. Great. Yeah. So so I wanted to ask you, uh, Susan, and I think this is so in, inspiring. But I was reading that uh, for years you you suffered from Crohn's disease. I did, and I'm 27 years Crohn's disease free. Oh, this year. congratulations! Thank you. Yes, it's amazing. I suffered for 18 years. I almost died five times of I had internal bleeding, oh. and um, each time, I just revitalized myself. It was kind of like, I call it the University of Susan. I learned everything about myself that was sending me to death, basically. And I had to decide that I really want to live 100%. Oh, my God. Got 18 years. Yeah, I have a friend who's been suffering from it for 15 years, and she came very close to death about a month ago. She was just bleeding excessively, and yeah. it just it, it freaked her out. Yeah. Yeah, it's not it's the, the Darth Vader of intestinal disorders, I call it. The Darth Vader? <laughs> it, it is. <laughs> it hides. It hides, and it, you know, you don't, you can't really see its face, and it'll attack when you least expect it, and you have to really... For me, I had to understand what disease meant in my life, what it was trying to teach me. That was a big thing. And also, you know, that it was going to teach me my purpose for Mm -hmm. living because obviously I was going towards death. So um, it's a huge, or what I call a human revolution. I had to revolutionize my whole human being. Mm Mm-hmm. And and so, you know, and it's kind of like now that I live with purpose and determination that disease can't nest in a body that's moving forward with purpose and mission and joy. Mm-hmm. How, how can it be curable, though? <laughs> that's the thing. Um, well, that gets into a, you know... We could go on for hours, but for me, it's the mind-body connection. And that isn't to say that people, that it's in your mind. I'm talking about mind, meaning a deeper spiritual mind. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and so I had to awaken to this kind of um, mission I have to help other people. Whereas, uh, you know, in the beginning of my getting sick, I was like, I can't help anybody. Who am I? You know, I'm sick. I'm, you know, I'm weak. I can't reach out to anybody. And my Buddhist practice, I was given guidance to reach out to people and become of service. And that would strengthen my life force. And I didn't understand that until I started to really try to practice it. And as I started to really help people, once I started sharing my experience, instead of trying to hide from it or be embarrassed by it, it's a very shameful thing, um, then 
I was able to realize that there, this was something that I could use to, you know, help other people to come out of their adversity, be it Crohn's disease or cancer or um, financial problems, family problems, everything that we as living beings go through. So how do we look at it? Adversity is something that we can transform into joy or into mission. Mm -hmm. Does that make any sense at all? It, it does. Yeah. And so then, of course, I put it all into my art and I wrote my solo show, um, Life, Death, and Entertainment. It's story and song. I did it in New York and L.A. and um, I'm hoping to get producers to back it to have it have a run and uh, have a toilet on stage and to say here's where I sat for 18 years bleeding from my ass anybody bled from their ass and <laughs> you <laughs> them raise their hand they go yeah I do what do I do about it <laughs> basically you know I tell the story of all the all the adversity I've overcome my father was murdered in 1996 my brother died of heroin and drug addiction a uh, baby boy brother died of hydrocephalus, complications from hydrocephalus, and there's addiction in my family, and, you know, we're, yeah. we're survivors, and standing up in the middle of all of that adversity is why I am who I am today. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you get involved uh, with charities uh, for uh, Crohn's disease or, or addiction or any of that? You know, I haven't yet, but my idea now is I, I want to contact the Iliitis Colitis Foundation um, and offer my show to them for if they have like an annual fundraiser for free and, you know, so that people can see that people can overcome Crohn's disease. It takes a lot of hard work and intense concentration on your life and what you need to learn, but, and you know, I always tell people they have to uh, unite with and love their doctor and be able to, you know, not just think their doctor is going to keep for them, but mm -hmm. work in a partnership. Mine was Dr. Marvin Darison. He's retired now, but um, you have to have all of the tools and all of the team fighting with you. And so I was going to, you know, call them up and see if they'd like to have my show be performed so they can raise money. Mm -hmm. And of course, my own, my own desire would be if I perform it and the, someone's in the audience that says, I'd like to produce that. Mm -hmm. Well, I hope it, d it does um, get picked up somehow and you do uh, get to perform it. Um, Thank you. Absolutely. So when did you form your, th your theater company? Theater company is, um, you mean, which one are you talking about? Because I've been to a few. The one you mentioned in the email that Anne is a part of? Oh, yeah, that's Theater 40. Um, theater 40 has been around since the 1960s, I believe. It started out as people m meeting in Beverly Hills and reading Shakespeare together. And then they started getting um, the community involved and uh, city council. And it's been, uh, it's housed in Beverly Hills High School. They uh, donated a, a, a particular section of the high school as a theater. And so they built it into this great theater. It's classic theater. Um, and I've been a member since 2014. Since 2014. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you're mostly doing theater these days. Have you done any on-camera stuff lately? I have done, I, well, I'm a member of, also a member of the Foley Mara Project. Uh, Megan Foley and Chuck Mara. And Megan's been a casting director for commercials for, and, and independent film, et cetera, for 30 years or almost 30 years. And her husband is um, Chuck Mara. He worked with, um, um, oh, so sorry. It's okay. 
uh, with, I'll think of it in a second. Um, he worked in New York as an actor, and um, so they, at one point, became partners together at Holy Mara uh, Casting. And uh, they would meet with actors and be very discouraged about their their uh, eight by tens. They were prepared. Um, they would not know how to market themselves. They'd come in um, not having done their homework, not memorized, whatever. And so they decided at one point they said, you know, they started telling actors, "You're the project. Mm-hmm. It's not, you know, Hollywood's not." giving you the project, you're the project. And so you need to find out what your season is and what your voice and, uh, um, you know, what is it that you're, you're wanting to portray as an artist? So they started this thing called The Project. And, oh yeah, Chuck, Chuck worked with uh, Lee Strasberg before he passed away. Mm-hmm. He's a trained actor as well. And so they take like 12 artists, 12 or 13 artists, and for six months they work with them on scene study, uh, commercials, um, uh, you know, um, relaxation, um, all of the method uh, exercises that I learned at ACT. I started revitalizing in my acting, mm-hmm. really that helped me change the tra- trajectory of my, my career. I started writing, I wrote a short film called Repercussions, and I star in it, and I wrote it, and executive produced it, and um, it won an award at the Golden State Film Festival at the Chinese Theater in Hollywood, and um, it's been accepted into the Silver State Film Festival in Las Vegas in September. And now I'm trying to write the, um, I shouldn't say try, I'm in the process of writing the feature film of Repercussions, because mm-hmm. when people see the short, at the end, they say, well, what happens next? I want to know what happens next. So that's my new, I'm creating my own entertainment. And I have a new agent that's um, in Texas called Spark Agency, mm-hmm. and they were, there, um, it's just been since March, so we're building up, you know, uh, our plans and everything towards being on camera again. Oh, awesome! Yeah, God, Susan, sounds like you know, you're just you're you've you've persevered so much, and you're just blessed beyond blessed, you know. <laughs> I totally am, Tommy. I really am. I'm full of such gratitude and appreciation. Ah, oh, that's that's just wonderful. I I hope I get to see you in a play or or a one woman show, you know, in the future. I hope so too. I'll keep in touch, and you know, hopefully, I'll be performing it here in LA, and uh, you can come and see it. Absolutely, I'm trying to move out to LA, and it looks like it might happen and stuff. I was there back in April, and I was having dinner with a guest of mine, and. Um, he offered me a part in his movie, and I'm waiting to hear on uh, hear from him on it and stuff. So it might happen. Oh, so you're an actor as well? A, a little bit. I mean, you know, I did some theater, you know, when I, in school and stuff. And um, yeah, I've been doing stamp comedy 13 years, and I, I screenwrite. Okay, that sounds great. Yeah. Sounds like Hollywood needs you. Yeah. It, it took me, it's, all it took was a car accident for me to get my head straight to, to pursue it. What happened? Uh, four years ago, basically, um, me and this guy who I'm no longer friends with, basically, um, we were out drinking. We were coming back from a bar in San Francisco to the peninsula, and um, oh. I, I fell asleep in the car. Uh, on the passenger side, he fell asleep at the wheel. We ended up in the middle of the road. We we got out of the car okay, but then uh, a car collided with ours, and the impact hit us both, and I got the worst of the injuries. Yikes. 
Yeah. What kind of injuries are you still suffering from them? Or? Well, yeah, I mean, I broke my leg in seven places. I'll always have the arthritis from that. Um, oh, my goodness. I had a mild heart attack. Um, my sternum was crushed. Uh, my ribs were crushed. Um, Yikes. I had, uh, I had gallstones, uh, broke some teeth, fractured my hand, lots of stuff like that. And wow, I, I've recovered and he just got this, uh, something, uh, happened to his eye and he, um, broke his pelvis and his arm and stuff, but, but I had the worst of it. Oh my goodness. Sorry about that. Yeah, uh, it's the best thing. Uh, that, it's the it best. It looks like you stood. Yeah, like you said. See, you understand. Adversity can turn into joy if we we look at it like that. Yeah, it's the, the best a new start. Yeah, it's, it's the best thing that ever happened to me. Otherwise, I wouldn't be talking to you right now. No, oh, that's incredible. Congratulations. Thank you so much, Susan. You are so yeah. inspirational, and I thank you so much for coming on today. Well, thank you so much for reaching out. I'm happy to do it. Maybe we'll talk again another time. Oh, I would love that so much. You have yourself a great night. You too. Okay. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Susan DeManti. Ain't she a sweetheart? I I I just really admire her so much more now. I mean, I, I mean, reading about that, you know, story about the Crohn's disease and everything. It's just wonderful that she has just persevered. I really love it. Um, I forgot to mention earlier, another guest of mine had a birthday today. Tiffany Vickers, my friend from the Bay Area who's come on several times. Happy birthday, Tiff. I love you, and I'm so fucking sorry I didn't mention you earlier in the show. Um, if you like this video, everyone, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Add me as a friend on Facebook. Join my Tommy Kovac comedian page on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram and all that fun stuff. Well, that's all the time we have this week on Splat from the Past. Until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, There's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Player dudes!